Kelly and Juliet Starrett, the dynamic duo, welcome to the Mindset Advantage podcast. And specifically, Juliet, welcome, because this is your first time. Kelly was on a couple of years ago, so specifically, extra welcome to you. Thank you so much. We're so excited to chat with you Chat with you today. We're not chatting. We're nerding out. We're, we're going to nerd out hard. We're, well, let's be honest. I felt I was very honored. You guys sent me an advanced copy of Built to Move. I read it. I loved it. I'm going to give it to my dad this weekend. He's going to read it. It's yes. such an incredible book. I'm just curious, before we set the table and we get into some of the X's and O's of it, why this book and why right now? We'll go. Take I'll a start a little bit. I'll take a swing at this. So as you know, um, from you know knowing us and our work, we have been working in the high performance space for many years and consulting with teams and professional athletes and elite military groups. And but then simultaneously, we have been uh, doing a couple other things, as you as you also know, running a CrossFit gym for 17 years, um, where we had some high level athletes, but we had a lot of sort of normal people who were just trying to be fit and healthy. Um, and then couple that with the fact that we live in a suburban neighborhood in um, just north of San Francisco in a community of people um, where we've become friends with our kids, friends, parents. And, you know, these are people who are, you know, professionals and, you know, regular people working busy jobs and raising kids. They don't have concrete stones in their front yard. They don't have, most of them don't have concrete stones. And although some of them might inspired by Kelly, but um, you know, th they're just kind of your average people, but what they universally care about. And these are the people that would, you know, members of our gym and members of our local community actually really do care about being healthy and having durable bodies. And um, so, you know, a couple sort of dinner table conversations we would have often is number one, we saw a ton of confusion in both of those communities, even in the CrossFit people, there was a lot of confusion about what diet to follow and how much to CrossFit and whether they should incorporate other forms of exercise and whether they should do zone two work. And, and then say, same within our community, we've become kind of the go-to people when, you know, if people have an injury or are questioning what to do from a health, health, wellness, fitness standpoint, we're like the go-to people. So what we saw in both of those communities was a lot of confusion, um, which, you know, we can talk more about, you know, as we, as we get into this podcast, we saw a lot of confusion. And so what we thought to ourselves is, you know, we've done all this work in, in these high performance environments, we've had access to all the fancy tools, gadgets, everything out there from a fitness standpoint, but, you know, let's really see how we can break down what we actually do for and our own health and business. For and, all our high performance groups. Yeah. And what's the basis for our high performance groups? What are we telling our high performance groups to do? And turns out those things are the same things that we want to be telling your average CrossFitter, your average, you know, neighborhood dad who likes to go to ride his Peloton and swing a kettlebell. Um, and so we just felt like, how can we sort of bring these people in to this sort of like secret amount of information we've been able to gather, which turns out it's not very secret. It's really all about the basics or what we like to call base camp behaviors. So we wanted to cast a wider net, um, demystify, invite people, to the party. invite people to the party, sort of figure out how to cut through some of the confusion and chaos in the health and fitness and wellness space. And so that that's where the idea came from. Awesome. I love the idea of base camp. And I've heard Kelly, you talk about that quite a bit on other podcasts. Why base camp? What does that mean? And how does that relate to the book? I think we started to see in fitness strength and conditioning, like there's a, there's a meme on Twitter, like strength and conditioning. Twitter is like the meanest, like be prepared to be bullied and have poo thrown at you. And it's just an ugly spot. And we have seen, and if you were a coach listening to this, you know, how, bitterly people will defend their place and attack things that are outside of their experience or outside of their sort of normal operation system. And one of the things that, you know, we, we see is we have to do, I forgot your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Curious on base camp. Oh yes. Like, why you called base camp. I, I started like thinking about all the chimpanzees on Twitter throwing poo at each other. And uh, you blacked out. For a second. I blacked out. It's like PTSD. So one of the things that we're seeing is um, in that there's actually a term for that called artifacts of scholarship is when, and it's important that we have highly nuanced conversations about minutia. That's important. That's a, that's a, that's a feature, not a bug that we argue about. Well, what, skills has better transferability or what tools am I using to facilitate better movement and play like that? Those are really worthwhile skills. 
And because that's how we all evolved, especially since we now we have access to gymnastics and Olympic lifting and sports training. We're really trying to synthesize and iterate that. But as people are arguing about which color rope is the best rope to climb Everest with, or which crampon gives you the best contact over the ladder, we think that's super cool. And those are worthy conversations to have. But meanwhile, no one is at base camp. And base camp is the place from which you launch those assaults. So if the metaphor isn't climbing, then it's, hey, we really think that fitness and resistance training is cool and vital, but that can take a lot of shapes. But we really shouldn't be building more intensity, more load, more stress without A, getting to base camp, or B, thinking about bringing people to base camp who may never, ever want to climb Everest. Like they're not interested in exercising. They're not interested in diet culture or body transformation. They just want to feel better in their bodies, not have as much pain and last a hundred years. And we think that those things are commensurate. So we're trying to just get everyone to start to have a set of benchmarks, what we are calling physical vital signs. That way we can begin to help sort of streamline the conversation about where are you? What needs a little bit of work and where are your blind spots? Mm, I love it. Okay. So before we get into the physical sides of things, I am a personal trainer, CrossFit coach, but I also do mental performance coaching, a lot of mindset coaching. And I just really want to hear from you guys before we get into the X's and O's. Mm. Tell me about the mindset that goes into some of the stuff, specifically mindset of aging. Um, I'm too old for this shit because I don't think if you don't have the right mindset when it comes to aging, this book might not matter because you just, not, number one, you might not pick it up. Mm. But number two, you're just not, you don't have the growth mindset to know. And I've, I've had a couple of people on the show, uh, an expectation effect uh, author who basically told me a statistic that the way you talk about aging and death and living can add up to seven years of your life, just the way you frame it. So I, I'm just so curious as a mindset coach, how does mindset play a, a role in your aging before we get into the physical side of things? Well, that's a great question that no one's ever asked us. So first of all, thank you. You know, I guess I would approach it this way. Um, I, I agree with you. There's going to be a subset of people who would never pick up this book because they're just, they're just going to, you know, they're just going to hope for the best. Um, and that's going to be the approach they take. This is empathy. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's going to be a drug or something out there that's going to help them when they fall off the the physical cliff or you know mental cliff. That that that's so you know I would say this book is not for those this, people. Let's call those one one percent people. The one percent of people, right? But what we've seen is that ninety nine percent of people do actually want to feel good in their body. And they do want to be durable. And we are obsessed, by the way, subtext with the idea of durability. And we prefer that word over the word longevity, because in the end, nobody really cares how long they live. If the last 15 years of their life, they're stuck in bed and can't do anything. And, and who, you know, how, so, if you can't live long, but yeah. you can't handle stress right. or, so, or the things that are coming your way. So, and they are coming. You know, your way. our goal is to be durable for as long as we're alive, whatever that means. You know, that's our goal. Our, our goal is not to live to be 110 years old. So just to clarify that. Um, wrong. Wrong. Well, I mean, sorry, Kelly's goal is to live to 110. But I, I would say that for those people who haven't, are, aren't just leaving their aging and, you know, f body feeling to chance, you know, I think there's a lot that people can do now um, that can make them feel better now. But there's also, I do think, has to be a bit of an eye towards what do I want to do in the future? And interestingly, when it comes to our bodies, uh, we don't do things like set goals. I mean, we've said this on other podcasts, but in every other part of our life, it's like commonplace to set goals. We all put money in our 401k. We don't get to enjoy it now. There's delayed, you know, it's, it's sort of delayed satisfaction in terms of saving money for retirement. We, you know, if we're going to run a marathon, we set a goal, we get a program, we work backwards, we do the goal. So, so I think that what we're hoping people do is say, okay, there's a lot of things I can do right now to feel better right now. And, and those things are built to move. But also the things that I can do to feel better now are going to reap tons of rewards in the future in terms of my aging. So, you know, for, for those people who just want like a hack and are just hoping to do the one thing, right, that's never going to work. I mean, I think it really does require an two eye things. on- It's cocaine things. and steroids. Cocaine and steroids. Yeah. It, it requires an eye on a few things. It does require a growth mindset. It does require um, sometimes not just living in the now, but 
actually looking forward into the future in terms of what it is you want to do with your body when you're older. And that doesn't need to be in 30 years. That can be five years, 10 years, 20 years. But I think if, if we changed our mentality a little bit as a culture and said, okay, well, I, everything else I do in my life, I set a goal for it and I work backwards. The same should be true for our health. So I have no idea if that even slightly answered your question. Be consistent before you're (laughs) heroic. That's a really important thing in that We know that championships and world-class efforts are actually built on day-to-day minutia. Like it's just, we just build on the day before and it's not very sexy. It tastes like bread. It's very plain. We eat, we sleep, we manage our stress, et cetera. So on the one hand, we'll say things like athletes that feel better tend to perform better. People who feel better and have more energy at the end of the day are a little bit more lucid, tend to be more interested in the world versus, oh, I'm exhausted. And have better relationships with their friends and their loved ones. So what we see is that those practices of giving someone better agency and control and feeling better in their lives, actually that's built on day-to-day small practices. And it's it's difficult because human beings, we're just not wired this way. But simultaneously, we want to remind everyone that no aspect of your body's systems works independently. So it's not your brain is separate from your skin, is separate from your organ function. It's These are all integrated systems. And one of the pieces that's highly integrative here into these practices is feeling like I am a member of a community. It's feeling like I have connection to other people. I have, I have loose network connections to the people in my neighborhood. And so, so much of what we're proposing here is actually uh, ultimately comes down to this idea of hyperlocality, which is we think that you can really change your household and then you can become a a house network hub, almost like a meaty grid system. And if we do that, we can transform society. I walk out and I know my neighbors. I go with a walk with my family. We sit down and eat dinner. Suddenly what we start to see is much better relations. And we find that people who feel safe, people who feel fed, people who feel rested and seen and validated, those people can go and buffer a lot of things the long way. I think sometimes we always want to start with the brain and work backwards. And in this situation, Juliet and I are saying, hey, the brain's part of it, sure. but these physical practices will encompass your brain. And, and if you view the brain as a social organ, it needs other brains to survive, period. So what does that mean at a grassroots level? Well, if you go for a walk after dinner and everyone goes for a walk after dinner, you start to see people, you recognize your neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. And the follow along effects are really profound. I think one other thing I would like to add on this mindset piece, one of the um, ways I I think we're hoping to change mindset around health and fitness behaviors is to eliminate the idea that health, anything you do for your health and fitness has to be done formally and in like one hour blocks, (laughs) because I think we've trained people to think, okay, you have to be only doing that thing. You have to only be going to the class. You have to only be going to the yoga class. And people are like, okay, I have to choose one thing. Like, okay. And my choice is CrossFit, which means I can't also go to yoga and I can't also go to my balance class and I can't spend four hours meal prepping, right? Like people don't have a lot of choice. And I think for us, one of the things we're obsessed with, and we hope we got across in this book is trying to give people tools and tactics to change their environment and and then in, in turn change their mindset about what it means to be active, what it means to have healthy practices. And those often can happen in like 10 minute increments. And that even if they are four 10 minute increments spread over a whole day, that you're still, it still counts, right? Like we've sort of taught people that it like doesn't count unless you're doing like this one hour block. And so I think, I think we're hoping this helps people, helps shift people's mindset in that regard as well to sort of say, okay, my, my health practices actually are more about what can I integrate into what I'm already doing into my day. And then anything else like that formal one hour exercise is bonus. Those things are a bonus bonus. Yeah. You guys crushed that one. Awesome. Well, let's get into it. So I think the first one is probably the most interesting one. The first habit is getting up and down from the floor cross-legged. Can one of you guys walk through the test for those listening, obviously not in the car, but at home, what does it look like? Why is it important? Walk us through. Well, let's let's you describe it. Let's yeah. go from the, the beginning. One, if we're talking about you being durable and independent and awesome, we want to have through line behaviors and narratives from I want to squat a world record to I want to play better soccer and run to I don't want to 
be put in a nursing home because I can't get up and down off the ground. And the first test, all you need to do is stand, cross your legs and lower yourself to the ground. So you end up crisscross applesauce. Without putting your hands on the ground. And most people can do 50% of this test, which is fall to the ground. So uh, hopefully you didn't fall and have to, but the real test comes in, can you stand up from that position without putting a knee down or putting a hand down? And oftentimes people are surprised that they struggle with this mid-range, low skill, low strength exercise that really expresses how positionally limited they are, how stiff their hips are, how inability they have to flex their knees. And if you actually ask a group of people, can you all sit crisscross applesauce? People are like, nope, nope, nope. I'm not sitting cross-legged. I haven't sit on the ground since NAM. So what we find is this test turns out to be an excellent predictor, well-validated and supported predictor of all-cause mortality and morbidity. So if you have to put a knee down or another additional arm of support, or you need a couple things or you're struggling up off the ground, it actually says a lot about the state of the human. The reason it's such a great test is that we tend not to think about our range of motion as a vital sign or a dynamic system or something I even care about. Really, I just go around my life. Maybe I can't put my arms over my head, but it doesn't really matter because I can solve that problem, right? With a, with a hand squeezer thing. And until my back hurts or my knee hurts, no one talks about range of motion. The only time we ever talk about range of motion is in performance activities. You're having a hard time locking out your snatch. Your turnover is slow. You can't pistol. Even in the CrossFit series, you know, people are like, well, I'll muscle snatch it and then overhead squat it instead of full snatching. Like well, you, you solve that problem. It's only when you're confronted with, I cannot do this thing, AKA a pistol that takes away my ability to compete or do the skill that people really give a crap. So this test shows you how your range of motion sort of immediately impacts your ability to move effortlessly through the environment. And it's a great way for people, I think, to confront that in a real way. Cause like I squatted you squatted, we squatted, but suddenly I can't get up off the ground because my hips are, are missing flexion. So now we have a way of in introducing behaviors around that. For example, sitting on the ground is a great way to solve that problem. And it solves a lot of problems. And it begins us, gives us an, an initiation for conversation about your range of motion and how improving your range of motion by testing in with this vital sign day to day means that you can improve your performance and power and durability. And the important thing about this test is like, if you can't do it, it doesn't mean you're going to die. Um, it is you a, die earlier a, a someday. piece of information, you know, and again, the reason we, you know, called each one of these tests a vital sign is that what we saw is that, you know, or what we are asking ourselves is why is it like the only health vital sign any of us have is blood pressure? Like everybody knows, okay, 120 or over resting 80, heart rate, resting heart rate. Like pe people started tracking maybe a few more of those vital signs in the pandemic, like, you know, SAO2 and some other things, but like, why are those the only health vital signs we have? Why don't we have benchmarks? And to us range of motion, quite a few, you know, quite a few areas of range of motion are important benchmarks, but if you can't get up off the ground, it does not mean you're going to die. It's just a piece of health information, just like if you got 120 over 80, but notably if you went to 130 over whatever, you'd be like, huh, okay, I need to, you know, I, I might need to change a couple of things, right? So it's the same piece of information. And importantly, unlike muscle mass and some other things that we do lose automatically as we age, range of motion shouldn't be one of those things. You know, you should have, you should be able to have the same range of motion as an 85 year old, as you do as a 35 year old. Um, but it is a bit use it or lose it. So if you don't practice and try to maintain your range of motion, you start to lose it. And so, um, that's another reason I think why we, you know, a, a sort of important sub point is like, you know, we don't want people to take this test and be like, oh my God, I'm going to die. Like it's not, it's a piece of information. And, and then we follow it up with a bunch of really easy, actionable things you can do to improve on the test that do Perfect. work. So, so, so let's go there. So Juliet, somebody's doing it right now. They're a little discouraged. They couldn't do it. What are some things that they can do to help to improve this test? Well, the, one of the main things you can do is actually just sit on the floor in part because in order to get to the floor, you actually have to practice the test, right? So we're and, big fans of like doing me, the thing. Let me jump in here real quick. If you're listening to this and you're trained, chances are you're familiar with regression and progression. And in CrossFit particularly, 
we moved away from doing a lot of skill transfer exercises for fundamental movements. We do skill transfer exercises. We do heaving snatch balance and things like that because there's some technical skills. But in CrossFit necessarily, we don't use a language where we say, hey, we're going to crawl on the ground because it's going to then help our squat. What we do is modify the squat. The thing that we're doing today, no matter what, is squatting. You may be squatting to a high box. You may be squatting you know, three inches, or you may be squatting front squatting or goblet squatting, but we're squatting today, and, you may, and that's okay. What we're doing, though, when we do those things is we're exposing people to the thing they need. That's the first order of business, not some fancy plan. If you want to get better, it sits up crisscross applesauce, you can't open down off the ground. The first order of business is exposure. Is, is exposure. So you get up and down off the ground, you sit crisscross applesauce on the floor. And because most of us aren't accustomed to sitting on the floor very much anymore, it, we naturally change positions. So we give people some suggested positions. But, you know, I, I anyone listening to this, if you sit on the floor for 15 minutes and crisscross applesauce, chances are you're going to get uncomfortable and need to move and put a leg out or sit 99. That's called meditation. You can't trick um, me. And yeah, you're, you're like, you can't trick me. Um, but what I will say is, you know, one of the things we love about the sitting on the floor practice is we know every single person listening to this is watching TV every single night or most nights. Um, and we love the, the way to get better at getting up and down off the floor is to just make a bit of a mental shift in how you do something you're already doing, which is watching TV and spend some of that time. You know, if you're watching three hours of TV, we're not saying sit on the floor for three hours. We're like, take a half an hour of one of your shows and sit on the floor, you know, and change positions and, you know, open up your hips a little bit, get back up off the floor and move back to the couch. So it's accessible and can be fit into something people are already doing. Perfect. Let's go to number two. We won't go through all 10 today, but I like number two, breathe easy, the bolt test practice every day. Talk to me a little bit, Kelly, about the breath and why is that so important? There's a, so much oh, out there man. right now about it. I know, yeah, it's know. Hot. Talk breath for, is hot. we could talk for hours about it, but what you guys do really well is simplify things. So talk to me about why breath is number two. So first of all, shout out to Wim Hof and Laird Hamilton and Brian McKenzie and you know, the kids at Butreco and Auction Advantage who, who've been carrying and James Nestor, carrying our water for yeah. a long time, trying to put this in. I think one of the mistakes or the things we think about when we think breath is that it's always about meditation practice. And one of the things that we saw in our community was that, wow, when we started to focus on mechanics and CO2 tolerance, I mean, now taping your mouth, that's not even weird anymore. That's that was super weird. But getting people more CO2 tolerant and improving their ventilation, we saw changes in pain. We saw changes in VO2 max. We saw changes in how we were having able to have our athletes pressurized before huge lifts. You know, the very, I don't think we've talked about this, but the very first, you know, I'm starting to dabble and be exposed to this. And I'm wondering, I'm like, I wonder how I can use this hypersaturation, right? Not, not hyperventilation, but hypersaturation. So one of our coaches Kristen Newman was an Olympic lifting national medalist. She's a very good Olympic lifter and decided she'd do some runs at the, at the Arnold for world's strongest woman. And she actually took second in her first competition at the world's strongest woman. And some of it is she's a mutant, but we started to game that, Hey, this test is 45 seconds long. So we started having her pre-breathe just like she was going to be breathing at the end. That way, when the gun went off she actually ran out of time before she got gassed and she was like i didn't get gassed at all i just couldn't go any faster and i was like huh isn't that interesting so we started tinkering with the application of breathing and what we found was wow we probably haven't done a good job of showing people why this is important and showing them how they can integrate this into a life because when we got into the breath practice stuff and i've been breathing probably seven years eight years like this i even went back even to my first set of notes where I'm talking in like 2008, the first course we ever taught, and we're talking about breathing and its effects on the parasympathetic nervous system. But when I started doing this, I started seeing all of the potentiation of this, whether it was, Hey, I have low back pain and I need to help desensitize this. I want to improve my aerobic capacity. I want to mobilize my thoracic spine. I need to, whatever it was, we started to see these huge sort of lay on effects that had nothing to do with meditation. Well, the one thing that I did not do and hated was like, I'd sit and meditate. And I, I did, I took a meditation class in college and set my alarm. We're but not when, great meditators. But as soon as my monkey brain, how, how did that go? <laughs> but as soon as I had a mechanical <laughs> breath practice, I started meditating every day. And I started practicing this because what I didn't see was that the meditation 
was like another add on thing that just didn't resonate with me the same way exercise doesn't resonate with some people or diet culture doesn't or, or food and nutrition. But all of a sudden I was like, holy crap, I do this and this thing gets better. I saw this immediate connection, but once again, we hadn't given people a, a, a way into understanding some of this, the body oxygen level test is like a CO2 tolerance test put forth by Patrick McCone. And it is really good from oxygen advantage. <laughs> Plus we started establishing this idea of one run rep max breath. So if you're listening to this and you find yourself slouching, go ahead and let yourself slouch for me. What we see is it feels so good. Uh, it's because we're all extension sensitive now we're all flexion loving as athletes. So in this position, I'm going to highlight something. Go ahead and turn over your right shoulder. Look as far as you can until you probably are going to bind up. Now watch this, get into a position where you can take a bigger breath. So notice I didn't say change your shape. Now see if you can rotate further. Well, it turns out you can rotate further because the hint that is instead of saying this is bad posture, this is good posture, we can start to say things like this posture doesn't support neck rotation. This position shuts down your available range of motion and physiology. This position truncates diaphragm function. And what we just did there by giving you this idea of, hey, can you take a better breath in a different shape? You immediately reorganized your position and got yourself into a shape where you intuitively knew you would have better function. And I didn't have to teach that. And so that means I can apply that when I'm at my desk or I'm sitting on the, the chair or my bike or powerlifting or anything. And that is what we're trying to do with this breath. I cannot emphasize enough for people listening because, you know, Kelly does still see the occasional client from like a physical therapy standpoint. And, and when he is working with someone with low back pain, of which I imagine many of your listen listeners have, su have suffered, he does two things. He first teaches them how to breathe. And second, he prescribes more walking for them because the assumption is that they're not walking enough. They're not putting their hip into extension. And those are the two things that Kelly first pres prescribes for low back pain. So I just can't emphasize that enough. Or non-threatening input, is, right? Just non-threatening you know, input. We need to get more see, movement. You can see how much we care about breathing actually throughout this book, not just in this chapter, because any of the chapters that are range of motion specific, you know, part of every single one of those tests isn't just getting into the position, but it, can you get into that position and also breathe in that position? Because Kelly's Kelly likes to say, if you can't breathe in a position, you don't own the position. So, Great so we have, we have a very, you know, we have a whole chapter focused on breathing, but it also, you know, you can tell how much we care about it because it really is sprinkled into all the other chapters as well. And because you're a nerd and you're listening you to this and that? you're a nerd, you're just making assumptions. everyone's a nerd listen to this we've snuck in these breath holds like can you ventilate in these positions but that's a sneaky way to make people do isometrics and isometrics are very powerful for control in your brain and for desensitization of painful tissue so notice we're like oh hold and breathe and so we can have multiple bottom lines at the same time i've had brian mckenzie and uh patrick McHugh and i we've talked a little bit about this but it's been a couple of years since we've had them on so so can you explain to the listeners just because i think they like a application what what is the bolt test what can they do the bolt test is simple really just sitting there take a big breath exhale as long as you can until you feel like you're gonna you know you, you start to twitch a little bit that's really you measure you measure the time that's right and what we can start to see there is you know how readily your brain can handle higher CO2 levels. That's really what this comes down to. And the reason that's important is that when we are ineffective breathers, we breathe through our mouth, we breathe through our neck, we over breathe and pant. It's because we've never been aware of it. We get uncomfortable and we immediately just open up all the floodgates for oxygen. What that starts to do is scrub off CO2 very quickly in our bloodstream. And then if because your CO2 levels drop, you can't have as much access to the oxygen on your hemoglobin. So one of the things we're trying to do is get people more comfortable with circulating higher CO2 levels. This means that you can start to have better access to the oxygen on your in your blood already, but also it has a whole bunch of follow-along effects in your brain. If people start to panic and they hyperventilate, what do you do? give them a bag they breathe into. What's that do? It makes them breathe CO2. So this CO2 molecule has really started to become more interesting, but 
the follow along effects are, Hey, we start to get better breathing through the nose. We start to see less tension in the neck. We start to improve your VO two max. We start to take better diaphragmatic breathing through the, through the belly. That means your low back functions better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's easy to go ahead and say, check this out. Here's a benchmark. And as we like to point out, go ahead and do it when you're super stressed and sleep deprived and you have a baby and a deadline and watch how your brain gets all twitchy. And no wonder you suck in the gym because you're like, oh, your brain is like, I can't take it. Blah. And then we'll do it when you're rested and feeling good. And you'll find that you can hold your breath or be comfortable with the, that exhale for a long time. And just back to my earlier point about um, making sure people don't feel like every one of these practices has to be something that is yet another hour they have to block off to have a breathing meditation practice. You know, the way that we practice breathing is often in our warm up when we work out. Um, because we've got 10 minutes where we're, you know, working on some skill-based stuff and we're that's old, the perfect time. And, and we need to get on the bike and, and warm up. Yeah. And so we have to actually warm up. Um, and then, you know, obviously we're huge fans of walking. So we use walking as an opportunity to do nose only breathing, um, and, you know, think about, and, you know, bring some focus to our breath practice. So, you know, we, again, aren't doing on most days, we are not sitting down and doing a formal breath work practice, um, largely because we like everybody listening to this, we don't have time for that. We have to fit it into other things we're doing. Otherwise it's going to be one of those things that just falls off the priority list. Very cool. Okay. So we have getting up and down, uh, breathing easy. Julia, give me one, one of your other favorites that we haven't touched yet. Well, it's not that sexy, but I am obsessed with walking and have been obsessed with walking for a long time. Let me hear. Um, and you know, there are so many reasons why I am obsessed with walking. I'll start by saying that the idea of 10,000 steps was originally created by a Japanese pedometer company as a marketing ploy. Um, cause 10,000 is a auspicious like a, Japanese number. Yeah. So now you live in 10,000 years. However, since that time, there has been a massive amount of research to sort of fill in and support that hypothesis, generally speaking. And that is, you know, basically the more steps you take, the longer you're going to live and the fewer chronic diseases and illnesses you're going to suffer. So the research has become pretty clear. Now, how many steps everybody wants to know? Um, what we know is that the average American walks around 3000 steps a day. And what we know is attainable um, through some slight behavior modification is around 8,000 steps a day. So we put that as the, the bare minimum That's where you get 8, all the benefits and work. you get all the benefits at 8,000. Um, you know, you can, you can, if, if people have time and energy and focus to walk 16,000, steps a day, like that's great. Like the more, the better, but you get a lot of the benefits of, of walking by getting 8,000 steps. So, you know, our, our benchmark in this book is eight to 12,000 steps. So, um, but there's a bunch of other side things about walking that I love so much. Um, one of them being the community piece of it. You know, I think, uh, you know, since you care a lot about mindset and how people are, you know, I'm assuming care about people's overall mental health. I think what we saw in the pandemic is that we're doing terribly, you know, depression is up. People feel more lonely. I think social media and all of our, you know, internet universe has really sort of exacerbated all that. And then, you know, add on the pandemic and it's like, it's, it's a really difficult situation. People you mean our having. trillion dollar fitness yeah, industry hasn't not, solved the not, problem. We haven't solved the problem, but it turns out that if you, you know, pick up a friend or a family member and take a 30 minute walk with them, you know, one of the things Kelly and I do is is we have this walk to the end of our block, which takes like 17 minutes. We often do it right after dinner. So it, you know, Kelly likes it because it helps him digest. So it has that side effect. Um, but it's also this moment in our marriage where we don't have our phones. We take 20 minutes to get some steps in and we actually can really talk and connect with one another. So, so I'm a huge proponent of walking because it is so community focused and so connection focused, but also, you know, there's a lot of media we all want to consume. We love to listen to audiobooks and podcasts. And so that's another way that you can sort of consume some of the media you want to consume as well walking. I find that I think better and am more creative and focused when I'm walking. If you have a hard time falling asleep. Yeah. The more you walk, the better you're, you know, we, we talk about how in Delta force, if the guys are having trouble falling asleep, the prescription they're given is to walk 12 to 15,000 steps. They're not given a drug. They're not given some kind of secret squirrel. This is how you sleep program. They're told you're not getting enough non-exercise movement in your day. And so you've got to walk more. Um, and, and the CrossFitters, if you listen to this, we fell into this trap with nutrition. 
right? We were like, one of the reasons paleo or even the zone worked for CrossFitters was that your CrossFit workout actually didn't burn that many calories. It's surprising. A couple hundred yeah. calories is what it burns. Mm -hmm. It's different than doing it redlining in a spin bike for an yeah. hour, right? Or like and a so three hour mountain bike. One ride. of the things that we loved about CrossFit was that you could do this intense exercise and still not have to eat a ton to support it. And you could still have energy elsewhere. Right. And one of the things that we're sort of recognizing around, you know, the walking is that we are seeing that you, while you exercise, you didn't actually accumulate enough fatigue of movement and total volume of movement, even though you did 100 thrusters at 135 pounds. Right. Thank you, Miko Salo. So what we're finding, especially in our CrossFit communities, we're actually still not moving enough, even though we trained. Yeah. And a lot of those people are, you know, checking the box and doing their one hour CrossFit workout right. and then sitting for 16 remaining hours yeah. of the day. Um, and you know, the other piece that's so great about walking and Kelly can be more of a technician about this, but we are both obsessed with the lymphatic system, um, which is the sewage system of oh, your body. And, you know, as everybody probably has experienced, you know, when it, the, the most obvious place people can experience their own lymphatic system, not working to its finest is when you get off the plane and you have cankles. Um, and, and that's just because you've been sitting there not moving and your lymphatic system hasn't had an opportunity to drain or why it's so critical for post-surgical patients to get up immediately and start moving around because they need to get the garbage out of the body. And so walking and for all the those CrossFitters in. out there is the perfect way to recover from hard workouts and get the garbage out of the body from doing 1000 thrusters. So, you know, the, and, and, you know, there's a couple other things I'll say. There is research out there to show that if you sit for 16 hours, it doesn't really matter what you do in your one hour workout, that all of that sitting is ultimately just going to cancel out the benefits of that workout. So, you know, again, talking about a mind shift, you know, it, that we're huge fans. We still CrossFit. We love lifting weights. We love bleeding through our eyes and suffering, but, but it is important to keep in mind that total daily movement is really important for a variety of reasons. And then the final thing I'll say, because everyone is obsessed with it is that you got to get some sunlight on your body. You got to like be outside Huberman sometimes, says it. according Huberman to said. Huberman. You have to get some sunlight on your body. And the best way to do that is to get up and take a 10 minute walk. Yeah. I think that's a phenomenal way to put it. Everybody, we could be checking the box five days a week doing CrossFit. We're doing a lot more than our neighbors, right? Everything's oh, going you're, well. you're like, killing like you it. You feel like you're crushing it. However, I can't get up and down the floor, uh, cross-legged. I can't do a couch stretch to full extension and I'm not walking more than 3000 steps in a day. That's I mean, why you're right? so stiff. And, right. Isn't that not me personally, Kelly? Yeah. And, and my, that might be contributing to your inability to fall asleep or sleep well at night. I mean, you know, that's the other feature of it is that, you know, it's like when you have little kids, your goal with your little kids is to like crush them all day long whoa, 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 so that whoa. they literally fall. Is that what you've you know, been doing to me all these years trying to yeah, crush me? Yeah. So I fall asleep. Yeah. So, mm. and it works because you fall asleep in like five seconds. So my, anyway. uh, my, uh, aura ring sometimes dings me because I fall asleep too fast. I'm like within a sleep within a minute. They're like, it took you. You fell asleep too fast. You're overtired. I'm like, nope. We have this ongoing wrong. thing where sometimes Kelly will say a sentence out to me. Like he'll finish his sentence on his out breath and then his in breath, he's asleep, you know? And then I will respond to him and then he'll be like, you woke me up. And I was like, no, just... we were in the middle of an actual conversation. No, I'm in the same boat, man. <laughs> I could fall asleep like that. Okay. So we have getting up and down the floor, breathing easy and are walking. Kelly, you're up. Give me one more that you really like to talk about. I really struggle with eating enough. That's always been my thing. And he loves cookies. <laughs> I do love cookies. So one of the things that I found was always hitting my protein macros was something I've always been working on. Like, it's just a lot of protein, you know, and you know, I know people are like Ryan Fisher's just rolled over in his grave, but um, for me to get 175 to 200 grams of protein every day feels like I just have to be more intentional about it. And then when I'm intentional about it, I hit it. So like, Intermittent fasting was a disaster for me because I was like, this is so sweet. I'll just have this little coffee and look at me. I'm, I'm burning fat. And then I was like, whoa, I am way behind on my total calories and my, and now what I got to do, I got to sneak in a meal at nine o'clock at night. Oh, great. That's going to help my sleep. And I also found out I was under fueled during the day. So by the time I went to, time to train, like I weigh 236, you know, I have a little bit of abs. Like I am, I have a lot of metabolic material here to feed. And what I found was if I wasn't more intentional about making sure I got enough protein at all the opportunities, I ended up being under the protein requirements that basically everyone on the planet says. And for me, that 0.7 
grams per pound body weight, that's 175 grams of protein. That's still like, I got to be sort of be on it. And what I find is that when I do that, I have higher satiety. I'm actually full. I don't, I don't, I'm not a snacker. I don't snack during the day. I have no desire to snack, but after dinner at eight o'clock, I'm like, Hmm, I wonder if there's cereal. I wonder if there's something else I can eat. So those behaviors that I engage in during the day around eating more to hit my minimum so that my tissue is healthy, my gut works, my brain works, my connective tissue works. All of those things start to sort of, again, interplay into a better, more sustainable system. The other thing that we have to shout out is we're huge fans of EC Sinkowski's 800 gram challenge. Yeah. yeah. And everyone, this is like, we, we have been privy to every diet hack culture thing from the zone to vegans to, you know, paleo primal. We've seen it all. All of them though, need micronutrients. You have to have micronutrients. So if you're only eating steak and having to take vitamins, we're like, eh, it's kind of an incomplete process. Like you need fiber and my vitamins and minerals. And what we found was that people thought they were eating healthy. Even I'm in the zone. I'm like, well, you didn't eat any fruits and vegetables. You did that all with, you know, Toast. quinoa, right? Toast. So <laughs> ultimately, you know, Corona is a poor substitute for eating an apple. But uh, what we found was that when people ate more fruits and vegetables, their, their tissue qualities were better because they were getting the building blocks and all the components and miraculousness of food. This also trended with this, this real change in performance nutrition that's happened in the last 10 years where we're seeing athletes eat more and more whole foods to fuel themselves, rice and rice cakes and those kinds of things, because whole food is always better. So whether you're a vegan, you're a carnivore, you're keto, we still feel like we have the solution for you. And if you're like, Kelly, I just can't eat that banana. It has a hundred calories right? Come on. It's a hundred grams. It's you can, you're okay. There a pound of cherries is 230 calories. So don't throw that sugar thing at me. That one cookie from Starbucks is like 350 calories, a pound of cherries. You're going to get diarrhea before you get like, you know, sick from the, uh, from the sugar. So the combination of those two things meant that also it gamified it a little bit for me because every single day I got to restart. And what's the old joke if it fits in my macros? Well, you know, the idea for us is, well, like if you've hit these two goals in terms of food quality and, and diverse protein sources and you're killing it, then a cookie on top of that is probably not the limiting factor to you. In fact, it may bring you joy and what we've really talked about here in a sneaky way is expanding people's movement choices, expanding their, their, all the options they have to care for themselves, even in nutrition. And that means that even if you don't want to really dial up and dial down your nutrition for body composition, which is usually why people do, we suddenly have a tool that will help you have the tissues to withstand the shit that's coming your way. Well, and I think most people and even people who are going to a CrossFit gym, Again, I think one of the ways we've lost our minds in the health and fitness business is thinking that most people care about having like shredded abs and, and, you know, looking so lean. Well, I mean, Kelly accepted, but most people don't Only care don't about that. Them. You know, e even people who are going to a CrossFit gym, they want to feel good in their body. They want to not feel gross. You know, they want to be able to move and do what they want to do with their bodies. And, you know, this is the same is true with the, you know, our friends in our neighborhood. And, you know, what people really like about this style of eating and is so critical is that it is expansive and, you know, and calorie, and, you get calorie you know, control in the bargain and Kelly has, you know, Kelly does struggle to eat enough, but like for me on the flip side, you know, I have literally done every restrictive diet on the planet and, you know, it's so, it's been such a pleasant um, and fun way to eat, to think about eating this way, because you feel like you eat more, it's expansive. You can still go out to restaurants with your friends and be normal. You know, you, um, you can, you know, it, like you can enjoy what is like eating is one of the fun things about being a human. Right. And I think, and one of the great performance benefits know, there, of eating with other people. And, and look, there are times I think where of course people need to be on more restrictive diets because they have specific body composition goals. And like, we're pro that like go hog wild on that. But for the vast majority of us who really just want to eat to be healthy and feel good in our bodies for the long haul, for the long haul, this is so expansive and fun and relatable and accessible. And, and we're such, and guess like, what? No one's doing how, it. We this just, is how we eat. We just saw that the obesity rates in kids came out last week and we're seeing these freakish obesity rates trend up 
56% of the kids hadn't eaten a vegetable last week, 33% or 35% of the kids hadn't eaten a fruit in a week. So what we're seeing here is, hey, we have a real opportunity to think differently about our relationship with eating. You know, let me give you everyone an example. We have the three vegetable rule. It's from our one of, a person who works with us named Margaret Mags, who's you know famous around the ready state here for being tortured by me. But Mags always cooks three vegetables. And if her kids only eat one, that's super that's cool. That's still a win. She's that's like, still sweet. a win. But there's always three vegetables. Last night we had four vegetables. Four vegetables. I killed it. I love it. Uh, next week I'm flying out to Arizona to start my book. And uh, I'm curious on the airport Ooh. test. Hands over the head, can't do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there to the airport on Tuesday and watch this. But because I haven't yet, talk, talk to me about where, where did this come from, and why is it so bad? Well, I want to start by saying I'm sorry because one of the the sad things about knowing Kelly, no, is just, that, we just observe, is that we observe, you we don't judge, can't unsee certain ways that people move. And I mean, it's no different from you're a CrossFit coach and you see a lot, you know, you, you yes. have the skills to see a lot of poor movement, yep. and yep. it's not lost on you. Um, I, I would say the recreational runner being the a number one challenging person for me to watch, but yeah, I mean, now it's like my experience in the security line has nothing to do with like, do I have my shoes off as my laptop and the right thing? It's like, how can I get into the line and like, see how people manage the airport scanner? So thanks. You're welcome. What, uh, we could really have called it this thing, the Andor test. If you watch star Wars Andor. You know, they're, they're in the, the prison, the space prison, and he's like, on program, and you're supposed to put your hands just behind your neck, and yeah, like they this. literally can't. You'll see that these actors cannot like put their arms the over their head. actors are in the line like this. And, they're, like they and they, they're trying to get their hands up, and you're like, wow, that's, that's really... The first time I became aware of this to give due, um, someone was asking Coach Mike Boyle, should adults Olympic lift. He's like, well, watch them put their arms up over their head in the, in the scanner. And you can tell if they're prepared for Olympic lifting. And I was like, Oh, that's, that's really crucial. Oh uh, yes. You should be able to Olympic lift. Yes. Muscle snatch. Everyone gets muscle snatches. If you work with me for the rest of your life, you'll muscle snatch a dumbbell at least. But what we're seeing is we're very rarely asked to put our arms over our head in some of these positions with rotation, unless we engage in a practice. I do downward dog. I do Pilates, I do CrossFit, I press overhead, I swim. If I'm not a gymnast doing overhead, there's a reason why these movements are there. And what we're, I think, trying to get people to start to think about here is your neck is connected to your head, is connected to your thoracic spine, is connected to your shoulder. They are a system. And if your shoulders are restricted, it's going to restrict how your upper back moves and ultimately what happens with your head. And when we start to improve functionality of the neighborhood, right? We improve your range of motion, your shoulders, lo and behold, you can take a bigger breath. Lo and behold, you can turn your head a little bit further. So we have to start somewhere. And again, when you struggle to put your arms straight up over your head, and what we've got is people laying on the ground, doing an isometric with the PVC pipe in front. It's one of the tests in our actual formal ready state assessment. But can you do that? Yes or no. Can you hold that isometric? Yes or no. It says a lot about the state of your readiness and that's okay. Jeff, someone say Julia. No. Okay. If somebody can't do it, I'm just trying to encompass everybody here. What do they, what do they do guys? What do they do if they can't put, you know, they do their test PVC pipe. I can't do it. It's frustrating. Where do I go? Well, there's again, the first order of business is to get you spending time in those positions. So if you come into our house, one of the things you'll see is there's a pegboard in our garage and then there's a pull-up bar underneath the door. And there's a lot of ways we have a, we have one of those chirp wheels on the ground that allows us to just work on putting our arms overhead. So there's, we have some excuses to put our arms over our head. And I think the average person does not. So whether you grab your sink and fold forward, or you do a, you know, you put your hands on the wall or you lay on the ground and you put a lacrosse ball somewhere between your shoulder blade and your back, there's a lot of ways to start a spending time in that position and B start to think, well, what are the components to that? And can I change some aspect of the system? So if I'm always stuck bent because I'm stiff, because I'm working a computer, you may or may not have pain from that. But the cost of sitting is your inability to put your arms over your head in this native range of motion. And the ranges of motion we're assessing here are really favorable to the person. We're not asking for super Simone Biles level capacity. Or we're just start at level capacity. Or that. You don't have to have mobility privilege. But what you do have to have is normal. 
and we're trying to get people back to normal. The range of motion, every physical therapist, every orthopedic surgeon, every chiro all agrees on is typical of the human animal. And I think one of the ways that we can sort of get out of this conversation of pain, no pain is the only thing we care about as society is to say, hey, the reason we're not huge fans of long prolonged sitting is that it, it starts to diminish your ability to extend your hip or put your arms over your head or take a full breath or rotate. And so suddenly that really gives us this idea of session cost, which is something we've stolen from our, you know, you do a brutal workout the next day, you're not very good. That's because the session cost. So we're trying to figure out ways to minimize that session cost so that you can adapt and work harder. But we can look at that same thing. If I eat a bunch of pizza and drink six beers, there's a session cost to that. One of our friends uh, just at Mind Pump just the other day said, oh, Monday morning, you're not, you're not, you don't have the Monday morning blahs. You're, you have, you have jet lag. You've been sleep deprived. You we changed like, your sleep schedule. You ate a bunch of weird foods. Jet lagged every Monday Everyone's morning. jet lagged on Monday. So that's the session cost for the weekend. And what we're asking now is to start to say with these vital signs, we can start to understand the session cost to your behavior and to the way you're interacting with your environment. That means that it's non, you're not a bad person. You're still really strong. You just ha have not paid the session cost. Well, and I also think the the one of the things with, you know, getting people to care about their range of motion is, you know, in the context of people want to be able to do what they want to do with their body, whatever that is, whenever they, want. whenever they want to. And it's only when they realize that their range of motion is stopping them from being able to do what they want to do. There and I think this is really critical because I think what people don't want to think about because they don't want to look forward in time is the ways in which your world can get very small mm -hmm. when you can't do the things you want to do physically. And that's not what anybody wants. Anyone wants to, all of us, anyone listening to this wants to have choice. They want to say, when I turn 55, if I get a, you know, if I decide that I want to learn how to mountain bike, and that's what I'm going to do from 55 to 65. They don't want to get on the mountain bike and realize that their poor range of motion is limiting their ability to do the thing they want to do. So it's like, this is the thing you've got to keep an eye on now to keep your choices as expansive and open as possible and to be able to do the things you want to do. I mean, you know, we were just talking to someone on their podcast, you know, and again, I know, you know, what happens to people in their sixties and seventies often, often isn't motivating to the 30 year old, but talking about how, you know, someone's mom couldn't put their dishes on the top shelf of the, you know, the cupboard because they were lacking the shoulder range of motion, right? And it's the same thing as not being able to put your bag in the overhead compartment. So, you know, most people listening to this probably have loftier physical goals. They want to be able to do more than just put their dishes away. Church for 15. Whatever it is, but man, you don't want to find yourself in a position of wanting to be able to do something and realize you can't do it just simply because you're lacking the range of motion. Right. You don't have to be sick to be healthy. You don't have to be broken to be fixed. I think that's kind of the, I mean, same thing with yeah. mindset. You don't have to be struggle with mindset to work with somebody like myself. You don't, you know, it doesn't have to be that to that point before you get help. Okay. So I think where we can end, uh, Juliet, I want to talk about um, the creating your environments. Cause I think this is where it all kind of comes together, creating a rich environment. I'm a big fan of James clear. He talks, he says a lot, motivation is overrated environment matters more talking yeah. about environment. I think this is a good place to close things down. Yeah, I mean, we couldn't agree more. We cannot ask people to rely on willpower and motivation. Uh, they're, it, you know, they don't have <laughs> that's, it. That's work. Like it doesn't work. We, we ran all, that experiment. We've all tried that. You know, we're all in this business. We've learned it works zero. What does work is modifying your environment so that it makes it really easy to make good choices for your health. You know, and we could give a thousand examples, but one of the examples that we like to give, and I've even made some videos about this on my Instagram, but we pep, we, we do something called peppering our environment. Um, and if you, if you took, a tour of our living room, which is small, you would see that we have baskets full of mobility tools and rollers and chirp wheels, and we have hypervolt percussion tools, and there's a set of Normatec boots. And, you know, we have these little mats on which you can sit on the ground. So it's more comfortable to sit on and the ground. And it still looks like a mid-century modern house. And it still looks house. cool. It doesn't cool. look like, like we haven't thrown away our furniture and become those weirdos. Like we're normal people. We have a couch and some chairs and stuff. Um, but we've made it really easy when we are hanging out with our kids you know, watching a show at night to make the right decision and put a little input into our bodies. Like we've made it really easy to do that. Or like, you know, the, I mean, we wrote an entire book about this, but like this thing we're at at our podcast is a standing desk and 
I've been standing this entire episode and I have a chair here, a stool. So if I'm tired or need a break or whatever, I can sit down. But, but the default position for me here is to stand and I didn't have to make a choice. I didn't have to have willpower, do anything heroic. I literally just set up my environment. So it was really easy for me to choose to stand for this entire podcast. So there are a thousand and one ways you can do that you know, hanging up a pull-up bar. I mean, we're huge fans of people just getting one of those crappy pull-up bars that you like put in between your door. Because, just to hang. Just to hang. You know, and, and if you have kids, kids love it. Like having a random pull-up bar around your house, you'll find your kid is swinging, hanging from it all the time. So we are always thinking about and trying to help people figure out ways to modify their environment so that they can, again, do not have to rely on motivation or willpower because that, that experiment's been run and doesn't work. Yeah, we want our environments, I like to say, to help us uh, swim uh, upstream or downstream instead of upstream, right? We don't yes. want to have any sort of friction that's going to make us. It should be a tailwind, yeah. not a headwind, right? And that's really, that's really, what, you know, at the end of the day, how do you feel? Like, you, you just, it has to be effortless. And, you know, the work I did as a physical therapist to graduate was looking at barriers to adherence. What keeps people from doing what they say they know? And are you telling me that people don't know they should diet and exercise? That, that can't be it. That can't be it. And so, so much of this book is filtered through a concept we originally came up with for the Marines. This, uh, we were working at the Marine Aviation Weapons Tactical School, and we called it the 24-hour duty cycle, which sort of helped people then conceptualize, where do I have agency and control? So, and then how do I shape the environment so I do an automatic thing and then just rinse, wash, repeat for a decade and let me know how that goes for you. If you have to make another choice, it's going to be limited. So here's an example. We work with a, a local collegiate a division one team that's a superstar, top three team in the country. It's down now to when they're at tournaments, women walk out and they're handed a shake and they're handed a bar right away, a chocolate milk and a bar on the spot soaking wet because that's what we're trying to do if we have to say oh go go collect your thing it's not going to happen but if i can go ahead and give my athlete the nutrition they need to immediately get some calories in and start to recover for the next session within the five minutes of tell what we see is those things are consumed mischief managed we didn't have to we didn't it was another thing we didn't have to do and like, that's that's what we want people to do in their lives. I'm a huge fan of Stacey Sims. And one of the things I learned from too. her, she's like she's so awesome. One of the things I learned from her five years ago was, hey, you know, if you're a woman and you really want to, you know, uh, get the adaptation you're looking for from the training you're doing, you should eat some protein within 30 minutes of exercise. Well, I found that logistically, I couldn't actually figure out a way to like make eggs and cook myself a whole meal within 30 minutes of exercise. So I would miss that window. And also, you know, ideally you get a little hydration on board after a workout. So I have, I just started after learning that from Stacy. I drink a scoop of protein powder mixed in water. It's not even blended because blending is one it's step warm. too far. Blending is like cooking for me. One step too far. I, sometimes it's like lukewarm water, whatever. I just, you know, I chug this protein powder and water and it's not even a thought anymore. It's just, I get, I finish my workout. I'm like a robot. I make this drink. I drink it. I get a little hydration and protein on board and it's the simplest possible, easiest thing I could do. And you know, it's also, then I've, you know, I've got 20, 20 grams of protein on board. So those are the kinds of things we're thinking about and tr always trying to figure out how do we make this easy for ourselves? Because, you know, one key thing is that we are not in a gym working out six hours a day and meditating and meal prepping. We're like hunched over in front of our computers working. Um, and so we've really had to figure out how can we fit these behaviors. And, you know, when we decided which things to put in this book, it was all about which things do we actually do? Have we been able to fit into our time crunch life and that we find moves the levers the most for us in terms of our own health? And that's what we wanted to share. Awesome. I end every episode with what I call the million dollar question. Some guests take a minute. Some guests, we go another hour with it. So I'm going to take, it for, <laughs> there take we go. this for, take this for how you want, but the question is very simple. I'll let you guys choose on who wants to go first. What's something, and this could be in any field, fitness, health, whatever. What's something that you know now that you wish you knew 10 to 20 years ago? The glacial pace is the breakneck pace. Real change your body and your density and your strength and your capacity and your skill and your family takes a lot longer. And it's that constant application. And it feels like you're not making progress, but you're making progress. In fact, you're making as much progress as a human can make. 
And so you have to just reset this timeline and be comfortable with the process. This is my, mine is much more pedestrian, but I was a D one college athlete in the early nineties when the fat free diet was a thing. So I spent my entire rowing college career where I was training 35 hours a week, very intensely, um, subsisting on bagels and red vines, um, and 100% not eating any, and still any amount of protein. College athlete. And, you know, I, I just, I look back on that phase and I think, man, I could, I was a pretty decent athlete and I could have been so much could more awesome somebody. if I'd had some, you know, tools and information when it came to nutrition back then. I mean, we just, you know, we were doing what was industry standard and best practice at the time. I mean, you know, but still it's like, if I look back and think, man, like I could have been more awesome if I'd actually been eating food. It's too late for me, but not for you. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, guys. Hey, this is a lot of fun. You're making me laugh a lot over here. My cheeks are sore from smiling. Uh, <laughs> Built to Move comes out soon. Where can people get it? What do you, The floor is yours. Uh, uh, the best way to get it is to go to builttomove.com and you can link to any of your favorite retailer. It's for sale in local bookstores and on Amazon and anywhere people would buy books. Um, and you can follow us at the ready state on all social channels. And then I'm at Juliet on Instagram. I'm a little bit more of the behind the scenes. You're not like, at Juliet, you're Juliet star. Sorry, at Juliet star at, you know, if you want to see videos of Kelly dancing and other antics of our lives, that's, that's where, that's what I do on my channel. And let me say this. If you're a coach or in, you're an athlete or a participant, we want that. We think we can take all the things we've been doing for the last decade plus all of us. And we can actually transform society through the lessons all of us have been and the experiments, all of us of which we've been part of. We think if we can get this book on the New York times bestseller list, we have a chance to actually get it into the hands of people that matter buy one copy and give it to a family member. That's the thing you're going to find. You're like, wow, I could go faster. And I had some blind spots here, but you can find that you're going to transform someone's life in your community, a family member, an aunt, uh, there's someone in your office who's curious about this. This is that solution to bring them along on your journey. Thanks guys. Appreciate it.